Good morning. We are live on Monday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. Today we have one of the fan favorites here on Coffee with Rich, returning guest, Dr. T.C. Fuller. In just a moment, I will read his bio and you will you will hear all about the esteemed Dr. Fuller. Uh, but as folks are jumping on, please like and hit that share button. You're definitely going to want to catch today's show. And I've just got the notification that we are live. That's pretty cool. Uh, I know that it is early, probably where you guys are, but please hit that share button and share this content with somebody because today everybody needs to hear what we got to say because uh, we're going to talk about some important topics today. Kind of do an off the cuff show. I didn't really send Dr. Fuller any any questions in advance. And truth be told, I wrote them while I was sipping my coffee this morning. So I want to say a good morning and welcome to everyone out there. And I also want to say, uh, please check out our sponsors. If you're in need of any really good gear, I would encourage you to check out our sponsors. They support the show. They make this happen. We have amazing sponsors like, let's get the first one out, out of the way, the American Warrior Society.com. You can take a free 14 day trial on Mike Seeklander and us, or heck, go check out the American Warrior Show, America's number one self defense podcast. We've been on the air for about six years now, producing content. We've got almost 300 episodes with everyone in today's uh, self defense community. It seems like it's been on the show at one point or another. We also have Century Martial Arts makers of the Bob XL. And I'm looking at my Bob XL here in the studio, and uh, he is uh, smiling at me. <laughs> No, he's not. He's frowning. But anyway, the Century Martial Arts makers of the Bob XL, if you want to take your striking routine to the next level, get a good cardio workout without going to the gym, you can put a Bob XL in your house and beat the crap out of Bob. We also have Appalachian Standard, makers of the finest CBD products money can buy. If you got an ache or a pain like me and TC, we're well into our 50s. I'm going to tell you right now, the CBD products may be a way to go. They have anti-inflammatory properties. They help you sleep better help you cognitively function better. It's everything an aging body needs. Uh, check them out at apphemp.com. Uh, cool fire trainer, man. I know that Dr. Fuller and I are shooters. Dr. Fuller is an incredible shooter. I will attest to that. I've seen him on the range. Cool fire trainer, man. Right now with ammunition prices being what they are, pick yourself up a cool fire trainer and take your dry fire routine to the next level. Also, Mountain Man Medical. I've mentioned this before. We have a branded trauma kit I reached out to my good friend, Justin Carroll, former MARSOC operator, who is now doing the paramedic thing. And I said, man, let's let's design a kit together with these guys at Mountain Man Medical. And Brian McLaughlin, uh, the resident corpsman over there at Mountain Man Medical, we designed a really cool trauma kit. Check out Mountain Man Medical in the links below and go ahead and pre-order that trauma kit and throw it in your truck, throw it in your home, everywhere you might need to be confronted with those kind of things that life can throw you. Last but not least, Precision Holsters, man. Big fan of everything Precision Holsters doing from the belt to the competition line to the Ultra Appendix holster that I use for my Glock 26. Absolutely love them. Looks like we got a lot of folks jumping on here, Dr. Fuller. That always flatters me when people actually take the time and invest in this, if I'm your guest. Yeah, they they, they love you. I, I get constant, uh, when are you going to get TC on again? So here he is, back by popular demand. Let's see, Mark is, uh, go ahead, sir. I was going to say, I'm happy to be here. Really happy to be here. Mark is on this morning. Good morning, Mark. Tony is on down in Brunswick, Georgia. Sean is on, says, good morning. Guile from the Philippines. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, Dr. Fuller. Nice to see you again. Mark is on, says, good morning, gentlemen. Coin number 976 from Hot Zone, Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Mark, glad to have you. Semper Fi, brother. And please, everyone, hit that share button before we go live. I want to make sure that everybody gets this content in their feed this morning. Ted. Coin number 1641 in the middle of Mississippi. If you're wondering what this coin number is, somebody just shared this content with you. Like, what in the heck is a coin number? You got to check out AmericanWarriorSociety.com and find out if becoming a coin member is right for you. My good friend Ruben out there is on. He says, you had me at Mountain Man. <clears throat> Ruben, I'm looking forward to seeing you at uh, FIDC this year. And if you're wondering what's an FIDC, my uh, co-host Mike Seekland and I teach a firearms instructor development course. And if you want to check out the schedule, Go to his uh, website, shooting-performance.com, and see if you can attend one of our courses this year. They're, they're, it's one of the things I'm most proud of in my, my adult life. Jake is on from uh, Vermont. William is on. Jason is on. Great to see you guys this morning. Dr. Fuller, let me read your bio just so everybody knows who they're dealing with this morning. This is pretty amazing. 
T.C. Fuller is an experienced federal investigator and firearms trainer. He has spent his life carrying a firearm for the U.S. government. T.C. first served as an infantry, Army infantry officer, explosive ordnance disposal officer before leaving the armory. Armory. Before leaving the Army to accept an appointment as a special agent for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He spent the next 20 years working in all areas of investigative interest within the FBI and served for several years as an instructor at the FBI's Firearms Training Unit in Quantico, Virginia. TC holds a Bachelor of Science in Criminology as well as a Master of Education in Interdisciplinary Studies and a Doctorate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. As a published writer, TC has written an innovative book on the topic of improving law enforcement deadly force training, as well as having written for several print magazines on the area of law enforcement procedures, explosives, firearms, and edged weapons. Among TC's personal achievements, he has been awarded the U.S. Army's highest peacetime award for heroism, the Soldier's Medal. Besides finding, capturing, and convicting a fugitive on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list, TC has also been a successful competitive shooter for more than 20 years, earning a master class certification from IDPA, winning numerous local, state, and regional competitions along the way. He now operates his own company, the Horus Group LLC, which serves as a consultant on firearms and training, as well as providing high-end private firearms training for both armed professionals and citizens. Good morning, Dr. Fuller. <laughs> Good morning, sir. It's an honor to have you on the show again. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, um, you know, you and I in the pre-show kind of chatting about it is I'd like to dig in more to your your time in Afghanistan. You told a couple of stories on a podcast you were recently on and forgive me, I can't remember which one it was, but it was an enjoyable podcast. What to, to, Tell us how in the heck does an FBI agent end up working in the mountains of, of Afghanistan? What was that all about? Well, that was a question I asked myself more than once while I was there. Um, especially when the snipers and the rockets and the snakes and the spiders got <clears throat> to work. But uh, the, the year prior I had served as an interrogator down in Guantanamo Bay. And um, that that's a whole nother story right there. But nonetheless, at that point, you know, it was early on in the, the G watt and uh, there weren't a whole lot of agents in the FBI that had the, the skill set that they were looking for, the experience that they were looking for, and were willing to go do these things um, in these places that they wanted people to go. So I came up on the radar due to my time in uh, Gitmo. And so they called me at the end of, I guess, the end of June 2003, if memory serves. <coughs> um, 2004, I'm sorry, 2004. And, uh, and they being, you know, a program manager up at headquarters that needed bodies in Afghanistan. And what we were doing... Uh, according to the conversation I had with him that morning was we were had a body of, of agents over there that were assisting the military. And that was such a nebulous phrase. I'm like, well, what, what exactly does that mean? Like, oh, you know, searches, interrogations, you know, train them up a little bit, do some of this, some of that. It was a very, very, uh, like I said, nebulous conversation that was long on patriotism and short on facts, you know? <laughs> so of course, uh, being the guy that I was at the time, I'm like, well, sounds good to me. Um, let's do this thing. And, and also remember 2004, I, like everyone else, I was pissed, right? Everybody was pissed. Everybody was mad as hell. Um, many of us lost friends on September 11th. Many of us have lost friends since September 11th. Uh, and, like a lot of people, I was spoiling for payback, just like everyone else. And payback for me didn't necessarily mean, you know, hurting anybody. It meant grabbing onto people, talking to them, getting the information, using the skills that I had uh, that I could bring to bear in, to help prosecute this war. So the I was going to oh, ask you, TC, I don't mean to interrupt, but not all. <clears throat> what did, did the Bureau have anything like, here we go, we got this guy. He's been face to face with some of these terrorists in Guantanamo Bay. He's a former army infantry officer, explosive ordnance guy. I mean, did that play into your resume as well as some of the other things? You know, I, I would love to be able to tell you, but I honestly don't know what their precise selection criteria was because it was never discussed with me. Um, so how they came to choose me based on what I brought to the table, I don't know. My sense is that, like so many things in so many large bureaucracies, I know a guy who knows a guy, this is a guy you should talk to. This is a guy we want. I think that conversation took place behind the scenes. 
um, you know, people that I was down in Gitmo with, you know, that was a real deal mission, right? I mean, we were really talking to really bad guys. And, uh, you know, I, I always quote Richard Pryor when I talk about Gitmo, when he said, thank God we have penitentiaries. I mean, because there were some people in there that were just, they needed to be there. If they're going to be above ground, they needed to be there. Um, so apparently I, the work that I did there came to light and came to the attention of the people that make such decisions, who then I'm sure looked into my background and said, okay, this is a guy that we can actually use. Does he want to go? And the nice thing about being in the FBI is, you know, hey, we want to send you to a war zone. Do you want to go? I mean, a whole different conversation than when I was an infantry lieutenant, right? Um, yeah. And then they started stacking money on the table, which, you know, also was an incentive. Um, you didn't go to, for the money. You certainly went, but it was a nice perk. So anyhow, they, uh, they asked me to go and, uh, I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm willing, but of course I got to talk to household six. So I went home and talked to mama and she was like, yeah, sure. Go for it. Uh, so I, I called him back the next day and this, we're talking about, I guess the last day of June. And I said, when did you want me to leave? I should probably should have asked that up front yeah. and said, wow, well, can you be down here in DC July 3rd? <laughs> I'm like, no. No, I can't be there July 3rd. I've got cases I've got to wrap up. I've still got to talk to my boss. They're like, oh, your boss won't be a problem, um, <laughs> which was true. Uh, so I said, you know, give me a week. You know, I got to tie up some loose in family things. You know, and of course, I'm thinking I got to do re up my will. I got to check my life insurance. Um, you know, these are things that having been to a war zone once before, I, I kind of knew what I had to get done. Um, interestingly, at the time, I was writing for a lot of uh, gun magazines. I'm dating myself by saying that, I'm sure. But I had a lot of connections with in the industry, as you do now, and Mike does as well. Um, and so the Bureau said, well, you know, I asked them, what equipment do I need and what are you going to provide? And they're like, well, uh, we got some stuff. Uh, we'll get you some stuff when you get there. And oh, by the way, and this is what tripped my trigger, bring, bring Big Blue. And Big Blue at the time was the blue... Uh, bulletproof vest that they issued all agents. And it's, you know, it's it was this dark navy blue with big yellow letters on it, FBI. And, and I'm scratching my head going, I'm going to go with no on that one. Um, and, and it worried me, one, because they told me that's what I had to bring because they obviously didn't have a vest for me. And uh, two, they clearly didn't have a good concept of sort of the color scheme one wants to be involved with when running around a desert environment. So I took advantage of a lot of those contacts I had and I got on the phone. I started burning up the phone. Hey, I need this. I need this. I need this. And, you know, I didn't get anything for free, but what I did get was the opportunity to buy it and have it drop shipped to me today. And that was, that was very nice. You know, a couple of people offered, Oh, you know, you're going over there. We're going to send it to you for free. I'm like, I can't take it for free. That gets me in trouble. Um, <clears throat> uh, Randy Martin of RJ of Martin site knives. He sent me a knife that, you know, people were on a one year waiting list to get. He sent that to me that day. Uh, and the check cleared, I don't know, a couple of weeks later when I just dropped in the mail to him. Um, but that was the kind of the example of the people that are in that industry that remain in that industry. Uh, and just, they just dropped what they were doing and said, he's going, get him what he needs. Ernie Emerson sent me some stuff. The guys over at Strider sent me stuff. I got a helmet. I got backpack. I got all kinds of, I basically I kitted myself out before I ever left, which turned out to be a good thing. So then I get down to DC and the, you know, the briefing was six hours of running around of which three hours was a trip to REI to pick up, you know, camping gear to run around the mountains of Afghanistan, uh, which I thought was a little odd, but the brief was, you're going to go over, you're going to drop into a cell. You'll be headquartered out of Bagram, which is those of us who've been there call it CONUS forward. Uh, you know, it was a big, big military base on the former Soviet base. And you're going to do basically what the military needs you to do. A lot of it has to do with interrogations. You know, military has their own interrogators, but they're trained more for tactical intelligence gathering. And law enforcement is a little different animal. Uh, and we were at this point, initial in the initial stages of combining sort of a military response with a law enforcement response, right? Because we're, we're killing the bad guys overseas, but we had a problem with people inside the United States. And those guys, obviously, you can't drop a JDAM on, on somebody I guess they tried it once in Philadelphia and that didn't work out too well. Um, so you, uh, you have to go find those guys and, and catch them and use evidence that has a chain of custody and, and, and is admissible in federal court. You have to get that evidence, as you well know, through legal means. 
So it's tar- it's tough to take a Marine Corps Lance Corporal and say, okay, go in there, bring me the prisoner. I want to know where all this stuff came from. I send a Marine Corps platoon into a compound and say, look, bring me a prisoner and all the paperwork. And that's what they'll do. They'll kill everybody in there. They'll break everything in there and they'll bring me one guy, you know, and he won't be in real good shape. Um, he'll have a, a freaking sandbag over his head. He'll be zip tied and they'll bring me a, a laundry bag full of paperwork, right? Some of it singed on the sides, maybe with a couple bullet holes, through. but they'll do exactly what you send them in there to do. The problem is, as you well know, if I'm going to put a guy in prison, I need this piece of paper came from who? What room was it found in? Whose pocket was it found in? We have to establish that chain of custody right off the bat. <clears throat> and it's a little difficult. And it's a little unreasonable, frankly. And then you break in that chain of custody and it's now fruit of the poison tree and it's, it's not going right. anywhere. Right. So teaching a Marine that when he's doing all the other things that he has to do is just a, yeah, it's a bridge too far. So they attached us to do that. And then the interrogation piece that I touched on, you grab a guy and is there a machine gun around that corner? Well, the military is very good at getting that information out of the guy. Yeah. Tactical. Okay? That's the tactical intelligence you talked about. Right. They're very good at doing that. And, you know, larger scale than that, but not a lot larger. Well, I sat down with at one point once I got to Afghanistan with the former minister of uh, internal security for the Taliban. And I interrogated him. Well, that guy, he's been in the bag now at this point for a little while. And his whole government is shot. So he's not going to, the tactical intelligence I'm going to get from him is, is, you know, next to worthless. It's all changed since he got put in the bag. But I can get some very, very significant strategic intelligence from it. And getting that information out of people, it takes a different skill set. It takes a different set of training. And we were apparently adjudged to be in a better place, in a better position and better educated, better experienced on that sort of interrogation. And so that's what we did a lot of. Interestingly, so, a lot of those interrogations started while bullets were still flying in compounds. Oh, really? Start talking to people in compounds. On one in one room, while there's still a firefight going on in another room. Uh, yeah, exact- l- l- oh, let ahead. me say this real quick. Uh, if I see a lot of folks jumping on. We're thank you to the 23 folks that are watching this live. If you're joining us this morning, somebody just shared this with you. We're talking to Dr. T.C. Fuller, retired FBI agent. He's telling us about his time as an agent in Afghanistan collecting strategic intelligence. And uh, I just wanted to give that moment because I see more more people that are jumping on Dr. Fuller. Go ahead. Sure. sure. Got to bring them up to speed. I see at least at least one former <coughs> uh, Navy guy that clearly you better speak a little slower there for diesel up in Vermont. We'll use small words, brother. Uh, <laughs> I, I kid. I love CBs. You guys are awesome. Um, so, yeah, so we were there doing that sort of thing. And interrogations and strategic interrogations and searches, it's best to start them. Well, the search, obviously, it starts right there on, on point it's best to establish that chain of custody on point. And imagine the impact on a jury in Virginia when you say, when I show up a year later and go, yeah, where did this scrap of paper come from? Well, I took this off of Akbar El Akbar in this town, in this place. Here's a picture of the building. He was in the third room on the left. It was in his front left pocket. I took it from him after a flashbang went off and it knocked him down and the Marines captured him. And I started talking to him right then and he gave me this bit of information. That's very impactful on a jury and it's very high quality information, right? Obviously you go out and you, you vet it and you, you back check it and you, you have additional sources to check that information. But if you can start establishing those relationships as an interrogator early on in their captivity, uh, it, it pays dividends as you go along. Our exact legal uh, stance over there, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, if I had been captured by the bad guys, I don't know. I mean, obviously there's no status of forces agreement with your opponent. Uh, I fully expected that if they caught me, they'd just kill me yeah. on, on video. But wh- how we had legal uh, authority to do what we were doing in, in the combat zone, I left up to the attorneys. You know, I, just, I never conducted myself in a way that I couldn't stand up in a federal court, either from Guantanamo Bay or Afghanistan, and not, uh, and, and not you know, take responsibility for what I did. I never comported myself in any way, shape, or form that, that would get me in trouble in a stateside case and I sort of obeyed our policies and laws regardless of whether they actually applied in the war zone or not. I was going to say, I don't think they applied, but I'm, I think that was a wise decision on your part. 
Well, I haven't, I haven't gotten in trouble since then. So <laughs> yeah. Tony says, I don't always dress up, but when I do, I still don't look as good as TC Fuller. <laughs> it's a camera trick, Tony, but thank you. Matt also says, sounds like the issues you were dealing with Dr. Fuller in 2004 were still an issue when I was there running an RDF in 2006, but at least some progress was made. Paperwork and photographs was part of the routine then as well. Yeah, they uh, they got a lot better at it. I mean, you know, the, the reality is a year, two years after the war started, these guys weren't these guys, the military wasn't looking to do anything other than what the military does, right? Kill people and break shit, if you'll pardon my language. And these units that are over there were very, very good at it. <laughs> very good at it. Uh, and the interrogation piece and the paperwork piece and the evidence recovery piece has eventually been trained. I mean, these guys are smart. They're, you know, despite what the a stereotype might tell you of an Army infantryman or a Marine Corps infantryman, they're just smart people. And they're dedicated people and they want to do the right thing. And once you convince them, look, this is the right thing. This is how we're going to bag this guy in Iowa and put him in a federal prison uh, and stop him from doing whatever it is he wants to do. They're on board. So then it's just a matter of training them up. And that, that's taken a while and it's taken a while for the military to get their policies and procedures in place. But I think it's in place now. Uh, and I think uh, they're still continuing to do great stuff in that regard. Now, uh, when you were in Afghanistan, you were you were rolling with all kinds of units, regular Army units, rather regular Marine Corps units, as well as all the way up to JSOC. Is that correct? That is. Um, we went after medium and high value targets, and there weren't that many of us there. <coughs> um, you know, and that's why I think most people don't know, like Mr. Jackson's talking about, they don't know that the FBI was over. The DEA was over there. They were targeting a lot of uh, poppy fields. You know, if you've never seen a B-1 bomber attack a poppy field, you just haven't lived because um, it's really damaging, really hits them in the bottom line. Um, but we were over there helping out. And a lot of people just didn't know because, you know, when I was there, I want to say there were five agents in country, six agents in country. That includes two bosses and two HRT guys that were assigned with um, the various color units, orange, blue, you know, what have you. They were doing the real high-end stuff when, let's say, HRT was there, or they were from HRT, but they would attach to uh, various, you know, ninja units and go do stuff. And now, what was the purpose of that? If they're an FBI, I mean, they have, you know, those units already have their own shooters and assaulters. What was the right. HRT guy doing? Basically providing the same service that I did, only to a unit that would go out and do much higher-end stuff. Okay. Um, you know the deal. If you're if you're in combat and somebody attaches somebody to you, you're not interested in babysitting a, a tourist, right? Nope. That's not what you're here to do. If it's going to cost me a private or a, a corporal in my unit, stay the hell home. I, exactly. I don't need you, I don't need one of my guys getting killed because you want to come out here and get some freaking happy snaps. Um, and that, that's sort of uh, de rigueur. Um, to answer your question, Mr. Jackson, yes, on occasion I was terrified. <laughs> it's pretty scary stuff, combat. But for HRT guys, they're, you know, at a, at a higher level physically. You know, those guys, basically they come to work and they shoot, they work out, and uh, they clean guns. You know, <laughs> and then in between they do other stuff. But they're in phenomenal physical condition. So if you're going to attach a couple of guys to a SEAL team, uh, they need to be able to, to get up and go. And a lot of the HRT guys used to be on these these tier one teams before they came in the FBI. So they speak the language. They, in a lot of cases, they know people and they're much easier to fit into and attach to uh, these units. They didn't go primarily as shooters. You know, that wasn't any of our jobs. We weren't there to shoot. We, we took guns and we carried them because, you know, the bad guy's not going to go, well, uh, wait, you're in the FBI. Okay. I'm not going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot that guy behind you. And, and so you had carried an M4, didn't you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I carried an M4 the whole time I was there. Yeah. Um, now, as your regular agent, I mean, again, you had years as an Army infantry officer, EOD guy. So, obviously, that platform you were well accustomed to. But for your average agent, are they that accustomed to it? At the time, the Bureau wasn't as heavily into M4s as we've become. Because, mm -hmm. um, again, this is almost this is more than 15 years ago. Uh, we still had the MP5s. We were still doing a lot of Remington 870 work, uh, like uh, like my colleague that you had on here last week was talking about the 870 shotgun, which he put to such effective use in Miami. Yes, he did. Um, he, uh, 
or since then we've moved more into the M4, but the M4 was the weapon there because that's what the military was carrying. It was easy to get ammo, it was easy to get parts, it was easy if you know you were out in the field, it didn't differentiate you. If anybody saw you, you didn't look different because you know the deal, right? You want to blend. Oh yeah. Um, you, know, you don't want to stand out. Uh, and the M4 is a great weapon. I mean, people complain about it all the time. I remember Jeff Cooper used to call it a poodle shooter back in the day. Um, the nice thing for us is since I wasn't DOD, I could carry hollow points. And I did. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, um, they they work. They, you do your job. You put the bullet where it needs to go. It does its job. It will it will get it done. So there was that. And then I carried a Glock uh, 17 the whole time. I did an article actually for a, a gun magazine on what the, all the gear that I carried. 15 years out of print now, but uh, it's out there somewhere. I'd love to see that. Tony asks, how many prisoners at Gitmo that you interrogated were later released by the following administration? Are you aware of that? I, I can't give you exact numbers. I, I do know that there was a big effort to draw them down to get them out of there. And when I was in Gitmo, we were trying to get the ones out that we could because in some cases, not a lot of cases, but in some cases, the special forces guys roll into Afghanistan, the war starts, and they're offering a bounty on Taliban and Al-Qaeda, right? Hey, give up this Taliban guy, this Al-Qaeda guy, we'll give you $100 or $1,000 or a goat or a mule or whatever it was they were paying. <clears throat> and so I live in village A, and you, Rich Brown Hekmatar, live in village B, and I don't like you. So I go to the nearest special forces go, you know, go hey, that Rich Brown Hekmatar guy, he's Taliban. Yeah. And they go, oh, okay, great. They bag you up, they ship you to Gitmo. And the whole time, you what are you saying? I'm not Taliban. I'm a farmer. I just I just farm, and you know, of course, that's what you would say if you were Taliban. Well, yeah, and you got a shovel in in your in the back in a wheelbarrow and all this shit, burying stuff by the side of the road or, or planting crops, whatever. Yeah, you, you're doing before. something right. And and again, the war fighters are just interested in getting you off the battlefield. We have information that says that you're a bad guy. Let's get you off the battlefield. We'll let the guys in the rear figure out who you are. So once you get to Gitmo. Then you guys like me come along and talk to you and try to figure out, okay, are you a bad guy? Or are you not a bad guy? If you're not a bad guy. Let's get you out of here. And there was a process and it took a while, but there was a process by which we would get you gone. Um, so to go back to the question, we were trying to get as many out of there as we could. Of course, you had to go back to the country that you had a passport from. So if you were Afghan, you'd go back to Afghanistan when we kicked you loose. But if you were Chechen, well, then you had to go back to Russia when we kicked you loose. And the Russians had a very, very stringent zero recidivism policy. Yeah, I bet. Um, you know, the rumors that abounded when I was there was that, you know, when the Chechens stepped off the American aircraft onto the Russian military airbase tarmac when they got repatriated, they'd be walked into a van, you'd hear a, a muffled shot, and then they'd come back and get the next guy, and they'd drag him into the van, a muffled shot. Um you know, but you had different groups like the Uyghurs. Most folks have never heard of the Uyghurs in China, um, but they're actually a separatist group in China that are Muslim, but they want to overthrow the communist government and replace it with a American style Republic. So they needed training before all this kicked off. So they were going over to the training camps in Afghanistan, getting training on how to be insurgents from the only people that would train them, which were their fellow Muslims. But when the war kicks off, their fellow Muslims start selling them out to the Americans. The Americans are bagging them up and bringing them to Gitmo. We're talking to them. And that was a whole other thing because nobody speaks Uyghur. Um, so getting a, a translator was a real bear. But you get in there and talk to them and they're like, yeah, we don't wish America any harm. We like America. We, we'd love for you to install an American style government in Beijing. That'd be awesome. Um, and we're willing to kill Chinese to do it. Well, okay, good. We like you. You're a nice guy. Um, and they'd sit there quietly and peacefully. But then the Chinese government would come in and say, because the Red Cross or their version of the Red Cross would have access to all those their citizens and just tell them, look, you come home, we're killing you. Um, and if you go to any of the countries around us, we're going to pay them a bribe and we're going to buy you from them. And we're going to bring you home. And we're going to kill you. So they were like, mm, we don't want to go home. We're fine. Staying right here. We are right. Staying here. This is great. Um, so what do you do with them? You got to let them go at some point. You got to send them home, but you don't want them to get just shot. So there was a, a whole system get these people gone and get them back home and how many are left now i think we're down to a few dozen down there now um nobody wanted them in their prisons in the united states you know nobody was like willing to take them you know a lot of congressmen were like get them out of there and like great we're gonna build a prison in your district no don't build a prison in my district not in my backyard that's not where i want them 
But get them out of there. Uh, just get them out of there, you, you rat bastards. So it, it's a it's a sticky wicket for both administrations, which is why it's still open even now. Yeah, I remember, you know, I think Obama campaigned and I'm going to shut it down. And then he now he inherits the problem. He's like, uh, yeah, we're not going to shut this thing down. It's not quite as easy as it looks. No. And I'm telling you, I talked to guys down there that flat told me, look, if you take these handcuffs off of me, I'll kill you right here in this room. If you let me go and put me back out in the world, I will kill Americans until Allah brings me home. It's all I want to do in this world. I just want to kill Americans. Well, what do you do with a guy like that? You know, he's been born and bred since day one to hate Americans, hate the West, wants to kill us. I'm going to talk to him and convince him otherwise. Well, <clears throat> that's a great question. So, uh, my wife and I were at dinner uh, one night down at uh, in Beaufort, South Carolina, where I was stationed in my last six years. And there was an older gentleman that was sitting near near us, and he's, "Hey, you know, we we're, we're me and my wife are just here for a conference. You know, what what's good food here?" And we we start chatting with this older couple, and I'm like, "Yeah, what are you doing here, sir?" He's like, "I'm I'm teaching a conference over on Marine, Marine Corps Air Station, Beaufort." I'm like, oh, what's the conference on? He says, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I got multiple PhDs. I've written all these books on Islam. And so we're, you know, now I'm interested. I'm chatting with this guy. I, can't, I wish I remember his name. And I said, so I said, let's cut to the chase here. You know, you've written all these books. You're, you're the you're the expert. And Marine Corps is paying you a lot of money to come in here. And what what is the solution to this, uh, these folks that are, you know, uh, like you said, uh, Dr. Fuller, that are uh, just so intent on killing Americans. And he, he goes like this. Now, this is like an 80-year-old man. He, he looks at me and he goes, that's the only solution. I'm like, okay. Yeah. With all your multiple degrees, that's that's the best solution you come up with. And if you're <coughs> listening to this show, uh, I just made a move to to shoot someone in the head, you know. And that was his, uh, that was his answer. Well, and, and it is very tricky. I don't know how you fix it. You know, when these people are raised from Jump Street in this environment, when they're indoctrinated their whole life, and oh, by the way, you catch them on the battlefield shooting at Americans. Um, can, can, they, I, can, can I just say something real quick? I, I always thought from the very beginning, and I don't know about you, Dr. Fuller, but I, I really thought as early as October 2001, okay, there'll be military tribunals when we catch these folks and they'll swing. I mean, we'll... We'll shuffle them in. We'll have some sort of kangaroo court. We'll put a colonel in charge of it. And we'll just have an assembly line of, of you know, doing a Nuremberg style uh, thing. And I, I don't know why that never took place. I can't speak to it. I, I don't know myself. I, I do say this, you know, they came up with this enemy combatant terminology early on, if you'll recall. And, and the Bush administration kind of floated that out there and, and that became the terminology. I kind of scratched my head over that. I said, well, why don't we just go with the Geneva Convention and say, look, these are non-uniformed nation state actors. And the Geneva Convention says put them up against the wall and shoot them. Um, exactly. It's perfectly in keeping with existing law that's been around for a century or the better part of a century. Why aren't we doing that? I'm sure there's a reason why we didn't do that. Um, and right off the top, humanitarian issues raise their head. I get that. But I also have talked to these guys. I've sat down and, and, you know, listened to what they had to say. And some of them didn't need to be there. Clearly didn't need to be there. We, we obviously had to do our homework and figure out who needed to be there and who didn't. But the ones that needed to be there, generally speaking, were pretty obvious about it. You know, they were, they weren't, they were very unrepentant about it. They were, as you might expect, a, a Muslim who's been conditioned to think, look, paradise awaits. You know, get these guys to kill you and paradise awaits. Um, you know, even the the Taliban internal guy that I talked to, he, he kept trying to tell me, look, Oh, you're the FBI. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I'm like, well, yeah, but I watched a video of you leading a bunch of people in stoning a woman in a soccer field because of, you know, some relatively minor infraction in my world, a big infraction in your world. I said, we're not the same pal. You know, I, I don't do that sort of thing. That's not my gig. Um, but in his mind, that was absolutely acceptable behavior and absolutely the way it was. Well, you know, and, and I don't want to get too uh, off topic here into philosophy, but isn't that like a postmodernistic thought in that there are no objective truths? Whatever the, the truth is to, to that guy in his culture is, is okay. 
and the truth that you have is okay. In reality, you know, there has to be some unquestionable moral things here and stoning a woman to death because a man saw her uncovered face that and the man wasn't her brother or her husband. So therefore we got to stone her to death. Yeah. Right and and uh, I don't find myself in agreement with Bill Maher often, but he's been pretty clear on his position on, on radical violent Islam. Yeah. And I find myself in agreement with that. I mean, it's hard for me to say I want to impose American style culture in the hills of Afghanistan. I struggle with that. Um, but when they come out of the hills of Afghanistan or they support people that come out of the hills of Afghanistan and try to impose their culture on me, well, now I have a problem with that. Yeah. And so if they're trying to do that by talking and publishing books and articles and what have you, that's one thing. But if they're doing it on the point of the sword, well, then they got to expect that me and a lot of people like me are going to respond poorly to that. Americans don't like to be pushed. You know, we don't like to be told what to do. Look, look at us with masks. We don't like being told to wear masks. You know, you're going to come and tell me that uh, our women have to be covered and or else they're going to get beat with rocks. Uh, good luck. The women won't put up with it, let alone the men. You know? No, and let's talk about that. You know, historically, some of my ancestors and my wife's ancestors here in East Tennessee, uh, there was a, a Scottish officer during the Revolutionary War, Major Ferguson. He invented the Ferguson rifle. <clears throat> and he said, uh, I'm going to come over, I think from South Carolina, I'm going to come over the mountains, the Appalachian mountains, and I'm going to quote, lay waste to that territory with fire and sword is what he told him via this letter that was curried over there. If you don't lay down your arms. So what they did was they, uh, they all got together uh, and they were called the over the mountain men. And they met major Ferguson at the battle of Kings mountain and killed him. And, uh, you know, you will not come into our area and impose your, you know, your British rule of law. We will not lay down our arms. And and we'll get into that in a little bit as far as what the Second Amendment is, because I want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, And they pushed back and it was one of the pivotal battles that led to the end of uh, British control in the South. But, you know, I'm proud of those ancestors of mine. And, you know, you're not I I think you're you have a great point there. You're not going to impose that stuff on me. So I'm really, as you are, TC, reticent to say, I'm going to impose mine on you. But I think we as human beings have to say, and I think this is why I make the juxtaposition with the Nuremberg trials, that there are objective truths. You cannot get out of jail free card because you killed six million Jews just because you says you were following the law or following the the orders, right? That's true. Um, We we have a tradition of struggling with internal problems in other countries. So you're having a civil war in your country and it's very bloody. We don't tend to jump into those. I mean, we learned a hard lesson in Vietnam about other people's civil wars are their problem. But in your example in World War II and in later examples in in this global war on terror, they're trying to export this stuff outside their borders. Um, And that's, that's a real problem. I mean, look at Syria. Right. Syria turns into a a civil war and turns into a lot of bad stuff going on in there. We don't tend to do a whole lot except keep them in their boundaries. Right. Okay, we don't like what you're doing and we're going to try and, you know, convince you not to do these things. But once you cross a border and start throwing bombs and rockets, then I think you're absolutely right. That's when we're going to come in there. We're going to crush you and we're going to straighten you out. Um, And we have sort of a a national tradition in doing that. It's it's a harder sell to say okay, Pol Pot is killing millions of people in the fields of, of Cambodia, but he's staying in the fields of Cambodia. It's harder then to say, okay, Mrs. Jones, your, your two sons are going to go fight and die in Cambodia to solve this problem for the Cambodians. Um, that, that's a harder sell for Americans. Um, but yeah. you know, these guys didn't, they, did, they didn't make it difficult for us. They came over here, they knocked down some buildings, they killed a bunch of people. And that's a surefire way, historically speaking, to piss us off. And, and when Americans get pissed, things get broke. You know, it's just the way it is. I remember in the book, Shaking Hands with the Devil, because your, your point about Paul Pot and the killing fields and this genocide, if you look to the Rwandan <coughs> genocide, Romeo Dallaire, who was the UN commander on the ground in Rwanda, <clears throat> he said an American from the State Department came in and he's, you know, Romeo Dallaire's briefing him and he's listening intently, he's scribbling notes down and all of a sudden he gets a calculator out and he writes some stuff down. This is all in his book, shaking hands with the devil. And he goes 82,746, some number like that. It's a, it was a number like 80,000 something. 
And he's like, 82,746. And Romeo Dallaire, General Dallaire, is like, what is that number? He goes like, that's the amount of Americans that, that that's the amount of Rwandans that can get killed per American loss that, that we'll be able to tolerate. So for every 82,000 Ameri- uh, Rwandans, one American soldier could die trying to stop the genocide. And the, just the fact that that sort of calculus is out there is chilling. I don't know about you. Yeah, it is. Um, but that's real politic, right? That's that's the way things get done in the world. And it, it may not be the most tasteful thing, but it, it's a hard sell. I mean, look at uh, – you had Dan Stanley on the show the other day. Right? We lost 18 people in the Battle of Mogadishu, and they killed more people than freaking polio. All right, oh, yeah. the Americans that were there, they wiped those guys out by any objective standard. That was a victorious battle, but we still get all queasy as a nation about, oh, we lost 18 guys. Yes, it's tragic, it's horrible that we lost those 18 guys. I get it, but we were there not imposing our will, we were there passing out freaking food, you know, trying yeah. to help people. So, my point there is you want to do the right thing, you want to help folks out. Like any addict, like anybody out there, unless they want to be helped, it's very, very difficult to force help on them. And it's hard to, you know, see these images of American soldiers being drugged through a street um, because we went there to help people. Uh, it's it's a hard decision process to go through, and I'm frankly glad I'm not involved in it. Yeah. Uh, Tony asks, thoughts on the current unrest with Hamas and Israel? Boy, that's a mess, isn't it? Um, and it, <laughs> it's very easy for me to blame current administration for their sort of bizarre approach to this whole thing. But I, I used to live over in the Sinai Desert. I was over there with the uh, military for a year. Um, that was very, very educational for me. I actually took a wrong turn once, almost ended up in the Gaza Strip. Uh, I was there when they, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel was assassinated. Um, so, it, you know, when we all thought the Gaza Strip was just going to get flattened, <clears throat> but Hamas is a terrorist organization. They got voted in. Um, they got voted into office. And I don't know if they're still in charge, but they're, they are there and they are rife in the Gaza Strip. I, I don't see as Israel is out in the wrong here. I mean, maybe I haven't read all the information that I need to, that I, I'm not fully uh, educated on this particular issue. But you may have a point that the folks and the Palestinians have an issue and they have, you know, righteous grievances and the Israelis have righteous grievances. But like I always say, as soon as you pick up a, a bomb or a gun to make your point, you know, you lose me. And these guys started rocketing Israeli civilian locations. And I've, I've been in Israel when it was, you know, rocketed. I've, I've heard the rockets go off. I've been close enough to several explosions to hear them. I've been there when suicide bombers were, were killing themselves guy called the engineer was working over there and was killing people left and right. So I, I understand the impact it has on the Israelis and I don't blame them. I mean, if you started rocketing Chicago, as much as I dislike the city of Chicago for a place for me to hang out, that that's not cool. You know, if Canada starts lobbing rounds into Detroit, then Canada's going to get swatted on the snout. And I don't care if you don't like me because of it. And the Israelis have one thing we certainly don't, which is just an ironclad political will. Uh, they're, they're more than happy to flatten you if you if you rise up on them, um, and witness the fact that they haven't been bombing Gaza and Hamas for the last what decade. Right. It took something like this, something as egregious as this attack, for them to step up, <clears throat> and and that's when they responded militarily, with a much less surgical fashion than they usually do. So yeah, do the Palestinians have a legitimate complaint? Sure they do. Um, is it a difficult process for both countries to work out? Yeah, it is. I mean, some of the best diplomats of our era for the last 50 years have been working on it and still haven't gotten it straight, but they're making progress, right? They're normalizing relations with other nations in the area. Um, but you've got some bad actors that just are very invested in this sort of politics of the gun over there and they keep having their way. So. Yeah, the uh, Mark asked, Rich, would you please repeat the info where to find Dr. Fuller's books? I'd like to get my hands on some of his material. Thank you. Uh, I wrote the book, as some of you may recall, under the nom de plume of Dan Bernoulli, B-E-R-N-O-U-L-L-I. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on my website at thehorusgroup.net. There's a link in the show notes, TC. There's a link in the show notes. 
Hey, look at that. I could have just shut up. I should have let the host do his thing. <laughs> no, but yeah, I've got links to uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the gray man concept. And uh, TC has an outstanding YouTube channel where he discusses his thoughts on this. And we're going to get his some of his thoughts. But all the links to, to the Horace Group, to TC, Dr. Fuller's uh, YouTube channel, everything's in the show notes today. So please check that out. Thank you to the 25 folks that are joining us live. Please like and share. We're just getting started. And, and we're going to switch gears here and talk about the gray man. And I'll just let you take us wherever you want to take us on that topic. <laughs> okay. Well, what I started doing was, like everybody, I, I watch YouTube. I sit in here in my office and I do stuff on one screen while the other screen is doing its thing. And somewhere along the line, I stumbled into this concept of the gray man, right? Which is a very big uh, issue for some folks in the survival community and some folks in the tactical community. Um, and I noticed that when I started looking at, at the idea of the gray man, which is the idea that you pass through life with sort of a, a minim, minimal signature. Uh, I'm not talking about lowering your carbon footprint so much as I am sort of your visual signature and not being noticed to just kind of blend in with the crowd, right? Just pass through life and not stand out. <clears throat> and when I started looking at some of the videos that were out there on YouTube, you know, like anything, it, it, it runs the gamut, right? Some of it was very good. Some of it was very bad. Some of it was downright incorrect. Well, yes, Chad, I do have gray hair. It's dashing, don't you think? Um, <laughs> I earned every one of them, believe me, yeah. <laughs> every single one of them. Um, but the idea is that you're gray, right? You, you fade into the background. I, I actually first heard the gray man concept when I went through the FBI Academy. And I was sort of my goal to get through the academy and not have anybody notice, right? Make it across the stage and they're handing me my credentials and the instructors are going, Who, who's that guy? Was he in the class? I, I bombed out of that idea probably within a week of being at the academy, just being who I am. But I thought, well, you know, I, I have something I might be able to say on this topic and maybe add to the conversation. Certainly not trying to tell people what to do, but giving them some information. Because I've spent a lot of time trying to be gray, trying to go gray um, professionally, right? I mean, when you're conducting a surveillance, foot surveillance, vehicle surveillance, whatever it is, you're not trying to be noticed. You're trying to watch people without them noticing you. And, you know, people tend to notice when you're watching them, right? If you're staring at them, they tend to notice these things. So you want to try and adopt certain techniques and approaches if you're going to conduct these surveillances and that makes you gray. So I thought, well, that, that, that applies a lot to the civilian world. Excuse me. And as a retiree, I'm not looking to do a whole lot other than to pass through the world unnoticed, right? I don't want to stand out. And I have friends that were in the bureau with me and in the military with me that they, to this day, dress like a 511 catalog exploded on them, right? They, they've got all kinds of cool guy gear and they look very tactical and very hua. And that's, that's awesome. Right? Good for you. And I think that's the problem, right? Like uh, what, you know, one of the things that just infuriates the crap out of me is this, <clears throat> social media mindset, Instagram, whatever. So you got to take that cool photo for the gram. And uh, I, I, I saw one about five or six years ago, and it was two blurred out faces, these two full sleeve tattooed, incredibly fit. They got ball caps on, some sort of cool guy T-shirt, plate carriers, uh, you know, a gun belt, jeans on. And, and the <coughs> caption, caption underneath it said, <clears throat> two NSW pipe hitters ready for low vis ops. And I'm like, there's nothing low vis about two white guys with full sleeves and bulging biceps with plate carriers on. I don't give a shit if they're wearing, you know, t-shirts and blue jeans. This is ridiculous. And, and so, that is a challenge. Those guys can go gray. Yes, they can. But that's not how you do it. Right. Especially. No. And, and I make that a point in my channel is look, you've got a mindset issue here. You've got sort of a, uh, how you dress issue, you have to dress appropriately, you have to, have, but it starts with how you think. And you got to think, look, what's my environment that I want to blend into? Those two guys could disappear at Fort Bragg, right? They, they could walk through Fort Bragg because there's a bazillion guys that look just like them. That's right. right? There's a lot of guys that look just like them. <clears throat> and within their Balawick, those guys are very, very good. Okay. You're, you're an NSW pipe hitter. Okay. Rock on. You're world class guy. And I have nothing bad to say about you. True. Because that's what your training and experience is centered around. My training experience is centered around something different. 
right? I want to be able to walk around and not be noticed until I decide I want to be noticed because that's really what gray does for you. It gives you options. It's like carrying a firearm. Firearm doesn't make you invulnerable from attack. It gives you options, right? There are options available to me if I'm a concealed carry person and I'm walking around as a civilian with a concealed firearm. Around, I have options that I wouldn't have without that gun. Um, now, I, do I have to take advantage of those options? No, I don't. But what it does do is it puts me in a position where the bad guy doesn't get to make my decisions for me. The bad guy doesn't get to force me into a set of decisions and set of options that I don't want to be involved in. A lot of your viewers that are watching right now are people that if I gave them the mission to, you know, if they had the mission to kill me and I gave them the option to guide my behavior in the way they wanted it guided, I, I'd be done. I, I, there's no way I would survive whether I could fight or not, they would put me in a position where I can't react in a way that's going to save my life. <clears throat> well, I want to be in a position where they don't even see me, where they don't even know they see me. And I'm just like, look at the, look at the other stuff, right? Um, the old look at the monkey, look at the monkey routine, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't, don't look at the organ grinder, look at the monkey. So uh, that's, that's where I want to be. And I think people that want to truly want to go gray, that's where they want to be. So if you're that big burly guy with you know the big arms and the full sleeves tattoos, well maybe wearing Solomon's is not the, the best idea everywhere you go. Maybe wearing a T-shirt that says "Kill them all, God will know His own" is not the way to go, right? <laughs> uh, but maybe it is. I mean, if that's the message you want to send, that's fine. I, I've certainly seen people that I've had conversations with people that have made the point: Look, if I if I appear like this, I'm going to put off bad actors. They won't attack me because they'll see me and they'll think I'm a cop. They'll think I'm a, a tier one operator and they'll leave me alone. I'm like, well, yeah, they might, but you've just punted. You've given them the initiative. And that's such a basic military tenant is initiative. You've given them the position where they can choose what is going to happen. They can choose to attack you. They can choose not to, but it's their choice. I remember you and I and Mike were at lunch one time uh, during uh, warrior camp a couple years ago. And you may remember this, where we're sitting at lunch and a guy came in, he was open carrying. Um, he had his shirt pulled up over his gun. You know, and he had like, a, I don't know, an Uncle Mike's fabric holster. Uh, you know, big orange shirt on, very attractive woman next to him. And his gun was kind of sticking out at an angle. But the fact was, he was displaying the firearm. And everybody at the table, we all kind of noticed it and passed around, hey, this guy's got a gun. Okay, moved on. <clears throat> had any one of us wanted to be a bad actor that day, Who's the first guy that gets got? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, he's not going to have a chance to employ that. Um, surprise is a weapon. And going gray allows you to keep that particular tool uh, in your toolkit. Well, and again, everything you're talking to is, is well-founded in the tenets of Sun Tzu. You know, draw yeah. them in with the prospect of gain and then take them by confusion because they were surprised and didn't see what you were coming. That's one tenet. Another one that, that you alluded to was this idea that if, if you're strong, appear weak. If you're weak, appear strong. So to that point, you know, I'm I'm wearing a polo, a nice polo shirt because I'm going to go in to have lunch with my wife and I look like a dopey middle-aged guy. But and then when the when the gun comes out or you get put in an arm bar, you, you're not going to see it coming. And that's the intent, right? Right. And the intent for me is to make it more difficult in their victim selection. First of all, they're not just, I don't want to stand out at all. I don't want them to see me at all. You know, and if they see me, I don't want them to notice me. And if they notice me, I don't want them to select me. Um, because if it comes to that, then surprise is on my side. Uh, a guy that's really good at it. I, I like is the guy over grand thumb uh, on YouTube. I don't know if you ever watch him. He's always yeah. wearing, you know, just plaid shirts, longer hair. Doesn't look like a military guy. He's probably killed more people than diphtheria. But, uh, you know, he just looks like a regular schmo. You wouldn't know that he was an SF guy. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about going gray. When I am not here, and you've seen me dress, not on the show, uh, I try to dress appropriate for the environment I'm in, all right? I come on the show, I wear a shirt and a, a jacket because I want to be respectful of you and your audience. Uh, when I'm walking around going to get my kids or going to have Taco Tuesday or something crazy like that, it's shorts, you know, some some sandals I can run in if I have to, but they look like, you know, just they're Keens and they just look like regular old shoes and, um, you know, baggy shirt and a baseball hat that doesn't have, you know, 
somewhere around here, I have one with an EOD badge on it that says, if you see me running, try to keep up. Okay, well, I wear that for PT, right? Most of the time it says the Bahamas or something crazy on it like that um, because I just want to be a low-vis guy. And if something pops off, my mission now is not run to the sound of the guns, right? It used to be. Now my mission is get off the X, be a good witness. And if I had a firearm on me or any weapon, its purpose is to get me out of here. So if bad guy is between me and the door and I've got to get out that door, well, bad day for the bad guy. But if bad guy is between me and that door down there and I want to go that way, well, then we don't have a problem. I'm just beating feet because I have the option because he didn't pre-select me. I was not his top tier target. And that's really what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and there's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with AFO within JSOC, but uh, Advanced Forces Operations, these these are the guys that uh, that go in ahead of the, the assaulters and they'll rent the cars, they'll set up the safe houses, they'll make sure the communication's all set up. They create an infrastructure and do some intelligence on the ground that facilitates when the shooters arrive. Well, you know, they have low-vis lockers because they need to know, like, what, does the average 30 year old wear in Yemen for pants, shirt? What's the common belt configure? What do they look like? And then they'll have that stuff pre-purchased, ready to go. Because to your point, you know, you don't want to arrive in the scene looking like a guy that walks around Fort Bragg all the time. Yeah. You want to look like whatever the average guy walks around in, in Yemen or Qatar looks like. They do a demonstration at uh, HRT when you come out there. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and it's really funny. Uh, the National Academy goes out and takes a tour over the HRT compound and looks at their shoot house, their original outdoor shoot house. Really nice place, as you might imagine. But what they happens is you got 250 or so people that kind of meander out there in a big clump. And these are all police executives, you know, high-ranking police officers in various departments from all over the country, all over the world. Um, so these are trained intelligent people, right? They know what bad guys look like. Now they're in a sort of a condition white because they're in the middle of Quantico Marine Base in the middle of the FBI Academy at HRT's compound. So they're not really switched on. But when they get there, the lawn crew is working, right? So there's a guy riding around on a 56 inch deck, zero turn mower, and there's guys with weed whackers and, you know, they're, and, and you just don't notice them, right? They're just part of the background. And just about every time somebody will walk over to them because, you know, they're making all this noise and somebody's trying to talk. Somebody walks, some of the cops will walk over there and go, Hey, did you guys kill it? You know, we're trying to get, can't hear with all this noise. Oh, well, we're, we're doing this and that. And then all of a sudden they all just drop their gear. M4s materialize out of God knows where guns come out and everybody's like, what the shit's going on here? And they storm the shoot house and they clear the building. And everybody invariably goes, where did they come from? Well, they were standing around. That was the guy with the freaking, you know, leaf blower. It was the guy on the zero turn mower. It was the guy who was over there weed whacking um, that you just didn't see that, that you saw them, but you just didn't notice them because they're part of the background. And it's very, very impactful on a lot of people that, and it certainly impacted me every time I saw him do it, that you could go from being invisible to being the pointing into the spear, just like that. Because you made the decision. Bad guy didn't force your hand. You chose. Well, and it's like a, a, a comment I made on social media. I know you saw it. We talked about it the other day. What's the difference between a, you know, a costume and a uniform? It's the person wearing it. So in that case, those HRT bubbas were wearing, they were wearing a costume, you know, or, you know, they, they were, whereas a professional lawn care, that's his uniform. But for those guys, it's a costume. And you're fixing to see what happens when the costume comes off. Uh, and, and I love that. You know, I knew we were going to talk about this concept and I was going to have a, a hard hat and, and a, like an orange reflector vest and just kind of like put it on, put it on. And if you saw me, a white guy with a beard here in, in East Tennessee with a, hey, stop your car. I've got my little lollipop that says stop the car and I've got my helmet on, my little hard hat, orange hard hat and orange reflector vest. Guess what you do? You stop your car. Yep. And then some guys would jump out of the, uh, the weeds and do whatever they got to do. But it's one of those things that I think lowering your profile, TC, I'm so glad that you're discussing that because it is such a broad topic. And it is something that our community, I think, desperately needs. 
Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and again, I, I'm not trying to tell people, look, this is the way it must be done. This is the capital T truth of your world, but it's just information that says, you know, factor this in, think about these things um, because this is what a professional would think about people that are professional in these areas. Uh, consider uh, the next video I'm going to do is going to be on vehicles. I think Jake Oliverta just mentioned something about it. Uh, it's, it's axiomatic that we, uh, we talk about Marines. Oh, you're a former Marine. How many EGA stickers are on your car? Right. Um, you can always, you can always tell a Marine, but you can't tell them much, right. But you can certainly <laughs> spot their cars. Um, and they're a very proud organization. I get it. I understand it completely, but it's giving information away or the stickers with, you know, my stick figure family, right? Well, now I know how many kids you've got. And oh, by the way, there's a, my kid was the star speller at ABC elementary school. Well, now I know you've got a kid at that school. 99% of the people that see that information, it's fine. It doesn't matter, right? They're not bad actors, but there are bad actors out there. And do you really want to be giving them information about you that they could make something out of? I mean, I don't put gun stickers on my car because I don't want you to think there's a gun in my car. Uh, my Ch wife yeah, Ch Ch I was going to say, TC, to your point, because it's a phenomenal point. Uh, Chad Ray, who's watching this morning, is a former Army soft guy, retired. Uh, he was a guest on the show, I think, a week or so ago. Anyway, he wrote an article for the site, just like you've written many articles for the site. And what he did was, I think he was still on active duty, and he walked around Fort Bragg, kind of taking some pictures of vehicles just to say, like, what do you learn from this, the back of this vehicle? Yeah. And you learn everything. The number of the kids, uh, where you know, you can take that tag number, get a private investigator, find out where they live. I mean, some things you can't get away from, but why well, give them additional information? Then he walked around and like somebody's orders, uh, uh, I think their unit orders were laying in the seat, in the passenger seat. I took a photo of that, had the guy's social on it, his rank, his address. It was just laid there for everybody to see. And um I think your point is so well made. I hope everybody's listening this morning. I, I hope so. I mean, I, I'm talking about stuff inside a car. I took a picture through a guy's window one time of a teddy bear and a, a note. And he was a pedophile. And he was there trying to get hands on a 13-year-old girl that he'd been grooming for a while. And she knew he was in town. And, and he'd left the door open. And this teddy bear and this little note that was fairly explicit. Um on his front seat. Well, I can't get into his car necessarily because I'm just walking past. I don't have a warrant, but you know what? Plain view, buddy. Uh, I took a picture of that and that picture ended up going into the court. And, you know, the judge saw that and used it as part of sentencing. Um, when he said, no, 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 I have no intention to do that. Well, you just gave the information up. You just handed it over to me. Um, like all the information people hand over on social media. Uh, they hand it over on, the, on their cars. And uh, I got to go look for Chad's article to read that because it's, I've been taking pictures of people's cars and I'm not at Fort Bragg, right? I'm out here in the wilds of South Carolina. Uh, and it's crazy the amount of information I get off of people's stickers, their political positions, um, their number of kids, what schools they go to, where they live. Some people have the little, I live in a gated community and I have a sticker that gets me in and out of my gated community and they just slap it on the glass. Um, it, it just, it allows me to target them. The IDPA stickers, I see those on cars all the time. Well, that tells me there's probably a gun in your car. Uh, or there's a gun on you. So if I'm going to ambush you, guess what I've got now? I've got the information on who I want to ambush to get a gun. Um, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of thought to avoid these things. And again, 99% of the people out there aren't your problem. It's that 1% that are, then it's a big problem. Um, yeah, Chad says, uh, I used to take <clears throat> pictures of vehicles randomly as targets of opportunity and use them in an operational security and surveillance classes uh, when I was teaching and, and my brother went to a counterterrorism course one time when he was with the international training team. And he said, you know, the, while they're out of their hotel rooms that day, the, another team comes in and like rifles through their stuff to make inferences about who these people are and see what kind of intel they can get if they were disguised as a cleaning crew. And then they do a PowerPoint slideshow like, this is what we found in your room. This is what we know about you. And it was incredible. So anything we can do to lower our profile, I mean, we maybe not need to be super hardened where we have, you know, everywhere we go, we're, we're anticipating someone rifling through our stuff in, a, in an Airbnb. But maybe that is your 
It depends on your threat profile, right? What your threat matrix looks like. Who's coming after you? Who are you locking yourself down from, right? Right. Um, and, and it applies to your home as well, right? I mean, I, my house doesn't have to be impregnable. And frankly, it's not. It just has to be harder than the guy next door, right? I mean, that's really what it boils down to. I, I want to be deselected as a victim. So, you know, my house has motion sensor lights. You know, they're solar powered. They're they're fairly mellow. You know, the dark places around my house get lit up at night. I pay the electric bill on it. You know, I put in some cheap lights there, but nonetheless, it's lit up. Um, there are rose bushes under my windows that are hard to see. You know, you go, yeah, can you get through the window? Sure. Are you going to have to tunnel through a rose bush to do it? Yeah, you are. Um, you know, I had a had a dog for a while, but it was a basset hound, so she was pretty much more a trip hazard than anything else. Um, but, you know, dogs are helpful. Um, like your house, I know you have those big lights out in your front yard. Uh, so I'm driving down the road. I'm picking a, a house to hit. Do I want to hit the one that's all lit up or maybe the one that just has one bare light bulb over the back door? Maybe that's the house I want to hit. Um, in my case, you know, there, there's a, such a layered perspective on security at my house that, you know, I, I don't worry too much. My wife does, but I, I always laugh. I said, look, if, if there's a house in this neighborhood we want to have broken into, it's the one with the two FBI agents in it, right? Yeah. That's, that's the house we want the bad guy to come to. We don't want the bad guy to go to the house next door where it's just a, a collection of victims. Um you know, so again, you want to deselect, you want to avoid the problem in the first place, especially now that I'm, I'm not on the cutting edge anymore uh, so that I can just avoid the problem on, entirely. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the, um, the second amendment. I kind of said a moment ago, well, <coughs> 30 minutes ago that, uh, that how the framers probably viewed it when they wrote the second amendment, they had just come off of a war uh, where they were having their rights infringed and where they were trying to take their firearms away. So as far as my opinion, I don't think it has much to do with hunting and sports shooting. What are your thoughts, Dr. Fuller? No, I, I think that's that's well established that it's not hunting and sports shooting. Certainly those are factors, and uh, we can make the argument today that that, that is a factor. <clears throat> hmm, odd noise in my house and I'm alone. Uh, but... The reality is it was written in, in at a time when, like you said, the war was uh, ongoing and then j had just stopped. I mean, it took them, what, 10 years to get that all hammered out after the war. Yeah. Uh, it was clearly put there to keep the government in check. Uh, for me, the Second Amendment battles that are going on now are just the, the battlefield that's out there. <clears throat> They're going to go after the first. They're going to go after the fourth. The Tenth Amendment's already pretty much gone. Uh, thank God the third amendment's still there. Cause I don't want a bunch of Marines lagered in my living room, uh, you know, without invitation, um, but they're attacking that amendment because it's an easy fix. Right. And, and we all know it's not the guns. I mean, a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, you could buy a machine gun through the mail and people weren't walking to the schools, shooting each other up. Uh, it's a cultural shift. It's a cultural problem. And you're attacking the tool that is chosen to use. What you need to do is attack the cultural problem, but that can't be solved in a single election cycle. It's not an easy fix, right? We got to fix the broken families. We've got to fix the educational opportunities. We've got to fix the social ills that create the violent backstop background that then facilitates people with severe mental health issues walking into schools shooting people up. Um, but we we keep passing rules about ridiculous things uh, that don't really aren't going to have the impact we want. I mean, and we have a habit of doing that in this country, right? Remember after 9-11, one of the first things they did no more curbside check-in. Curbside check-in? What did that have to do with anything? What did that have to do with anything? It had nothing to do with anything. Well, we got to stop the curbside check-in. And everybody went, oh, thank God, curbside check-in is there. We're, we're all safe now. No, no, not at all. You know, oh, we're going to, ATF is coming up with their new proposals. Uh, okay, but you're closing the door after the cow has left, right? The horses are out, buddy. There's 300 million guns or something ridiculous like that in this country of which 99% don't cause a problem, you know, but you're going to go after the guns. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, the only guns I've ever pointed at another human being, the only ones ever in my life were given to me by the government. Good point. Right? They, they weren't, um, they weren't my own personal guns. They were issued to me. Um, uh, is that relevant to the conversation? I don't know, maybe. But I the think so. Amendment, yeah, the Second Amendment is there so that we can 
defend ourselves from a tyrannical government. And people say, oh, you can't stop the United States military. They've got bombers. They've got tanks and battleships and nuclear weapons. And like, okay, tell that to the Vietnamese. Tell that to the Afghans we've been fighting for the last 20 years. Tell that to the Iraqis we've been fighting. Tell that to the Syrians we've been fighting. And we will drop bombs on them, right? We'll, we'll happily put warheads on foreheads in those countries. <clears throat> it's a little different story when you say, hey, look, you got to fly up to Boise and, and drop some B-84s on a neighborhood because they're not, you know, giving up their guns. That's a harder sell to most pilots. Um, so the idea that we're going to have a, a, a full-fledged uh, knockdown drag out inside the United States is, in my mind, not really relevant to the conversation. What's relevant is what we're seeing now is sort of a tightening, a slow tightening of that fist um, where they're, they're sending people out to, to do things that, you know, a lot of cops aren't necessarily comfortable with. I, I look at uh, last year in Hong Kong, <clears throat> and I see a lot of change, right, between one year and the next. One year, the cops were not going to really confront the protesters, probably agreed with them in a lot of cases, weren't really looking to involve themselves in repressing these folks. A year later, they're out there bashing heads. Change all the cops out? I guess it's China. They could have. But what they probably did was they, they put the screws to the cops, and some probably quit and said, well, I'm not doing this anymore. And some probably said, I don't want to do this anymore, but I don't want to go to prison. And, you know, I'm 15 years into this job and I've got a pension on the horizon. And, you know, I got dental care and health care and I got sick kids and kid going to college. And I just got to do this for five more years. And all right, I, I'm not real comfortable with this, but I guess I'll go do that. Well, if that can happen there, there's nothing that says it can't happen here. I mean, None of us want to think that as a serving police officer, I'm going to put people on a train to a camp, <clears throat> right? None of us want to say that. <clears throat> but everything the Nazis did was legal. It's a good way to get yourself. Jeez. A friend of mine is here and he didn't tell me to knock on the door. So I heard somebody creeping around my house. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I swear to God, I hear somebody. All right. So I, I was expecting him. I just wasn't expecting him right now. Um, all right, so we're good. Uh, but I just, I, I worry that people will head down that path. And then if you attack the Second Amendment, it, it removes a significant disincentive for people to behave that way. That makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I, it does. Yeah. I, I used to say when, when we thought Hillary was going to win and, and defeat Trump in that election, you know, there was talk about seizing guns, right? That first became uh, sort of mainstream Democratic a political plank was, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to seize these firearms. Yeah, but they don't, that's not necessarily the language. The language is like not uh, mandatory buyback. Right. That's what a mandato mandatory buyback is yeah. confiscation. Right. And I, and I actually walked into my boss's office one day, we were talking and I said, look, we, we were, he and I were talking about something else, but it, it came up about firearms uh, buyback or forcibly taking guns from people because he knew I was kind of involved in that community. I said, boss, I said, you can give that order. And I said, and I'm a 19 year agent, right? I, I'm pretty much at a point where I can tell anybody to go pound sand. And I don't care. Uh, but I was like, if you think I'm going out into the hills of Western North Carolina, up into those you know, <laughs> back country up there and tell some good old boys that they got to cough up their guns, I, you're high. I'm not going, up, I'll never come back. They will bury me so deep in a mountainside. You will not find my scent. I'm like, no. You could send an infantry battalion up there. They're not coming back. You know, you just can't do that. Can you seize guns in Boston? You can try. <clears throat> but there's an awful lot of people in New York City getting killed with guns, and guns are illegal there. Um, good luck. I just, I don't think you're attacking the right thing by attacking the Second Amendment. Attack the underlying causes of these problems, and then you have a, a way of making inroads. But that's going to take generations, and nobody wants to put that kind of effort in. Well, like you said, you know, we, uh, we talked yesterday on the phone and 14 people were shot at a house party in New Jersey. That's weird because <clears throat> when I was in Jersey a, a year or two ago, uh, training a, a group of federal agents, my partner, Mike Seaclin and I, you know, we called the agent in charge like, hey, look, you know, you've hired us to come up there. Uh, what's the situation on guns? Can we get out of get, get some sort of letter from you feds that says we don't have to pl play by the rules like. Nah, man, can't give you that, you know, the, yeah. the rules are what they are. But when you 
come to our range. We'll, we'll give you whatever out of our armory. And I'm like, so we would have to disarm ourselves for the drive back. And it's just like, but because we're, we're good guys, we play by the rules. You put the rules in place. We'll drive our, from our hotel where we're armed, disarm ourselves as much <laughs> as me and Mike can drive to the armory, let you arm us, teach you all day, disarm ourselves and drive back. Whereas the bad guy does not give a crap about your laws. Right. And it's not like you're going to be attacked on the range, <clears throat> right? No. That's not where you need the gun. <clears throat> Excuse me. You need the gun for that drive in between. That's where you're going to get carjacked. That's where you're going to get in an accident with a guy that comes out <clears throat> swinging a tire iron or, you know, that's, it's counterintuitive, but it's Jersey. And yet yeah. in that environment, 14 people shot. So again, it's not the guns. I mean, the guy that shot all those people would have gone after him with a kitchen knife. He would have gone after him with a bat. You know, he, <clears throat> he would have driven a car through the living room if, if the guns were magically vanished. You yeah, got Timothy, Timothy McVeigh, uh, TC, correct me if I'm wrong, killed like 168 people with fertilizer yeah. and, and fuel. Not a gun in sight, right? 26 kids in a uh, daycare. So, you know, and that's... Uh, if you are a religious person, the first murder was with a rock, right? Yep. You know, I mean, look at England. All the guns are gone. What's happening now? Well, kitchen knives are a problem. What are you going to do when the kitchen knives are gone? Cricket bats. <clears throat> I mean, people are at their most creative when it comes time to inflict injury on one another. Uh, so you're not going to solve that. It's just an easy thing to attack. Well, they, they have as acid attacks over there, right? I think they're averaging three acid attacks a week. Somebody walking up with a Starbucks cup, and at the last second, they pull the lid off and douse uh, acid in your face just to rob you, and you're permanently disfigured and blinded for life. Right. But they don't have guns. No. We had a, an agent, or not an agent, we had a support employee in Washington, D.C. when I was up there from the Washington field office, FBI employee, walking down the street. <clears throat> Guy walks up, says nothing, makes no eye contact with him, just sticks him right in the chest with a steak knife. And a guy behind him, that he didn't know was there, jumps out, pats him down, you know, figures out he doesn't have a wallet. The guy just wasn't a person that carried a wallet, says no wallet, and they both take off and they're gone. People will find a way to hurt each other. <clears throat> but so it's not the guns that I think we should be putting all this effort towards. What is it? it it's the underlying social ills. Mm. Okay. You look at any of these inner city communities, for example, where you have, in essence, a genocide going on, all right? Chicago, uh, St. Louis. Uh, New York, everybody likes to quote Chicago just because the numbers of bodies that are dropping up there are so out of control. But now look at some of these defunded police departments, Minneapolis, some of these other areas where the murder rates are going through the ceiling. <clears throat> it's more effective in my mind to address the underlying social ills that are putting people in a position where they turn to violence as a methodology, an acceptable methodology. You know, you start giving people jobs, Give them the education to pull themselves up, and that's what they're going to do. But instead, we, we put them in this cycle where they're just sort of trapped, and the only thing they, they know how to do is break laws. And some of those laws are laws against violence. <clears throat> but gun control, going after the guns is just easy. That's just low-hanging fruit. My, my, my friend and former guest in the show, Todd Fox, uh, who BJJ Black Belt, former Marine, Madonna's bodyguard, et cetera, et cetera, he sent me this yesterday, T.C., uh, St. Louis's murder rate, already the highest in the United States, soared last year. The mayor vows to defund the police. And if you if you read uh, the current mayor there, Democratic African-American female, just telling you what she is, Mayor Tashara Jones' budget proposal would close the city jail and divert $4 million from policing to social programs and fire, well, she says cut, 100, million, 100 police jobs. Now, how is that going to fix the problem? Well, it, it presupposes that it's an either or selection, right? You have to get rid of the police in order to do these other things. <clears throat> I would tell you that <clears throat> the only way to do these other things is to first create a safe environment in which to do them, right? The first thing you do when you go into a country like Afghanistan is you get people to stop killing each other. You get people to stop shooting, right? You get the tanks off the road. <clears throat> okay. The first thing you got to do is install peace. Once there is peace, then you can, have all these great and glorious things. She wants to cut the budgets because that's that's the the thing to say these days. 
<clears throat> what she doesn't seem to realize is if she cuts the budget and the police all of a sudden go away, there's a lot of folks that, <laughs> you know, the only reason they're alive is because it's illegal to kill them. Oh, yeah. um, and she might find herself in that position where all of a sudden the, all the people that would have kept her alive and protected her from people who wish her ill are gone. <clears throat> you know, I always laugh at these college kids and say, oh, we want get the police off campus. I'm like, the only reason that you're not getting your teeth shoved down your throat by people that violently disagree with you is because of the police. You make them go away and guess what happens? What? There's no downside. There's no legal problem with me beating the crap out of you. All right, we beat the crap. Here. All of a sudden, the football team runs the campus, you know, because they're the biggest guys there. Well, exactly. It's like you want to you want to go somewhere where there's no police. <coughs> I highly encourage you to pack your family up and live in Somalia for or South Sudan for a year. Let me know how that works out for you. Right. Uh, Chad says the defund the police movement is the height of ignorance. Just blows my mind. Um, Greg says, uh, Greg Goshling, we were in the Marines together. Uh, he's a reconnaissance Marine says all democratic cities. And it, it, it certainly seems that way. And, uh, James Dalton says, good morning, you handsome devils. Good morning, James. Be safe out there on the streets of, of Vegas today. Yeah. I, I don't understand this. So you have the, the highest murder rate in the country, which means you have probably in the top 10 in the world, highest murder rates. And your solution is I'm going to divert $4 million. I'm going to shut down the jail and I'm going to fire a hundred police officers. How does that make sense? We've really gotten into this loop in America where people are given the responsibility and the authority to make these decisions, but there's no, I guess there's authority to make the decision. There's no responsibility for the outcomes. So they pay no price for being wrong, right? I mean, you really look at the Supreme Court and their decisions around Oklahoma in the last year um, really display that. But <clears throat> the fact is she's going to make these decisions. It's not going to impact her. I mean, if it impacts her, it'll impact her ability to get reelected. It's not going to impact her in terms of where the violence strikes, Right. Because when the violence breaks out, the first place is going to hit is going to be in the low income areas. Because the, they, they're just going to be the, it's just the way it is. The high income areas. I mean, if you if you suspended police protection in my town, it's not going to be a problem for me because me and my neighbors can afford private security, and we would get together and we would hire private security and we'd have private security. It's going to affect the people in the trailer park five miles away that yeah. can't afford that. And that's where the criminals, a lot of criminals live in those areas. And that's where they're going to choose to victimize in those areas because that's what they do when there is police and the police are gone. They're going to do it even more. <clears throat> and so for her to say these things and do these things completely unimpacted, you know, she can make all these decisions she wants and it's not going to impact her. They saw yeah, it in that, Baltimore. Oh, good. Say that again. Dr. They, they saw it in Baltimore where Mosby, you know, and then the mayor, remember when the riots happened after uh, Freddie Gray? Yep. We want to give these people space to protest. Well, their protests were burning and looting and everything. And that was the perspective she took until the protesters moved into her neighborhood. Then she energized the police and had them descend like the wrath of God on these people. You know, it's, it's okay for thee, but not for me. You know, mayor Chicago did the same thing. Yeah. Right. And it's completely disingenuous. And, and what blows my mind is that people continue to vote for it. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm like, if that's the way you want to run things, fine. I'm going to vote against you, even though you're a member of my party. But we've become so, you know, partisan in our outlooks these days. Well, it's my party. I got to vote for him. No, no, you don't. You don't. Well, have humans are incredibly tribal animals. I mean, we right. just are. And once we find our tribe, man, we're we're all we're all in. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> but my country, you, right or wrong, right? My tribe, right or wrong. That's right. And uh, to your point about, you know, it, it's not going to be that big of a deal for the folks in your community, but go down the road to the trailer park or the section eight housing. And you're going to, yeah. those people are really going to be in a mess and they're not going to be able to raise their families. They're going to be afraid to go to work and leave their, or, or let their kids walk to the school bus alone. I mean, these are terrible decisions. And I've had on here, um, I can't remember the general Neil Taylor, who's a corporate attorney in South Africa, Johannesburg. Ooh. And, Oh. Yeah. And, and he's like, when they, de when they defunded the police in 1994, you know, when apartheid fell, it just made life worse for the poor. He goes, I live in a gated community with other professionals that can afford it. And we, 
our entire community is has razor wire and a giant 12 foot concrete fence. And we have former South African Defense Force guys with machine guns riding around a bear cats inside our gated community because it's, it's nothing. But those people down the road don't have that ability to afford that level of private privatized security. And that's what happens when you make a, a security vacuum by pulling out the police. It's the rise of security policing. And I'm going to have uh, one of the leaders in South African security on the show here in a couple of weeks. And I think this Friday I've got another South African firearms trainer coming on because the reason why I keep bringing South Africans on is they're the canary in the coal mine. They've already tried a lot of these feel-good ideas that Nelson Mandela put in there. And you can see that the chickens have come home to roost. What kind of a mess is going on there? Yeah, well, I mean, look at your own experience as a police officer in your community. Did you spend the majority of your time responding to crimes, violent crimes, in the affluent neighborhoods? Never. Okay, so now reduce the number of law enforcement that are out there. Are the affluent, affluent people going to suddenly start shooting each other? Probably not. Are the violent people in the communities you were already responding to going to be emboldened? Probably. Um, but we continue to do, like you said, we, we instill these, it sounds good. It makes me feel good to say. Um, <clears throat> it, show, it, it demonstrates what a good person I am. Policies that have nothing to do with reality. I mean, facts and trade-offs and, and diminishing returns, these are things that have apparently zero impact on some of these zealots and, and it should have an impact on them. I mean, there's, there are costs for these decisions and they're not paying them. the people making these decisions in a lot of places are not paying those costs. So what's the downside to making those decisions? Well, there's nothing but upside, right? Cause I make these decisions and people at my cocktail parties think I'm a great guy and more money gets donated to me by wealthy donors and I can get reelected and keep this job. Sure. There's blood in the streets, but you know, it's an opportunity for me and my party. Yeah. And uh, I believe it was Mark or Tony asked the question earlier is like, since we know that, you know, we've outlawed these schedule one narcotics and of course that didn't work. We've outlawed murder. That didn't work. So we're going to outlaw guns. And to your point about stabbing people, with steak knives and Cain killed Abel with a rock and all this stuff. It makes me wonder what is the motivation if, you still want to get rid of guns and you, it flies in the face of the data. So like, what is the motivation here? What is it truly? Uh, that's where I kind of I scratch my head, just like some of our viewers just want to do. I think for me, at least and from my perception is it, it's a good buzz phrase to throw out there because these folks aren't pandering to the middle so much anymore. They're, they're pandering to their extremist fringes on both, both parties are doing this. And it sounds good to say, we're going to get rid of guns, okay? Because they recognize that the extremists on the other side that say, no, you're not going to get my guns, we're never going to vote for them in the first place, right? They're, they're just not. And their own extremist fringe won't, won't necessarily vote for the other side, but they might stay home. And that has cost them elections recently. So they're like, look, I got to get those people outside. And I just have to be palatable enough for the folks in the middle to get them to vote my way. I just have to be a little bit better than that other guy. I mean, how many politicians have you looked at <clears throat> in recent years <clears throat> and said, man, I really don't like a lot of this guy's policies, but on these couple of policies I do like, and you know what, That's that's I'm going to vote for him because he's just, for me, from my perspective, he's just a little bit better than that other guy or girl. Um, and that's what these parties are doing. So attacking guns, they, they have to realize, look, we're not going to get all the guns. You're just, it'll take lifetimes to get 300 plus million guns away from Americans. And when you do get them, you'll only get them from the law abiding folks. You're not going to get, and you know, and some people are going to obey the laws up to this point and say, oh, this is the, well, you pass another one? No, I'm not obeying that one. And, and it'll stop. Of course, as soon as you use the gun in any way, shape, or form, then, then the law is going to drop on you like a ton of bricks. Uh, but even look at it right now, just the way things are going with ammo and, and firearms and what have you, people are really, really cutting back from getting outside and, and shooting and, and going out and practicing. Uh, so they can go after various components of the Second Amendment and get you to not utilize your Second Amendment. But again, it's less about getting the guns off the street, in my mind, than it is about sounding good to the voters and to getting sound bites on TV and to, you know, it's clickbait, basically. Yeah. And Sean brings up one of those kind of clickbait issues here. Sean says, 
Camden, New Jersey is used as an example of successful defunding of the police. They fail to mention that all they did was replace Camden City Police with the newly created Camden County Police and then and flood Camden with county police while removing the police from the areas surrounding the city and go figure crime went up in the surrounding areas. Yeah. And, and Sean knows what he's talking about. He's a chief of police up there. Uh, shout out to the National Academy 269 class. Um, but that's in a lot of cases what they're doing, right? They're just shifting the numbers around. Uh, if you think that defunding the police in St. Louis is going to uh, stop all policing in St. Louis, you're wrong, right? Because the state police will have to pick up the, the, the baggage and so will the county. <clears throat> but it shifts the dollars around in a way that she can point to and say, look how great I am. I saved us all this money. This doesn't stop the crime. If anything, it's, the crime is going to get pumped up uh, and it makes it up somebody else's problem, right? It's not my problem anymore. It's your problem. And again, she's not paying the price for it. When she picks up the phone and calls 911, someone's coming to her community and they're coming right now, especially when she says, I'm the mayor of this town. Get somebody out here. There's probably you know, cops guarding her house anyhow. Um, it's, it's that single mother with three kids working two jobs, living in the hood that, you know, has bullets racing through her living room and has to sleep in the bathtub, you know, with her kids at night. So they don't get shot in a drive-by. It's her that picks up the phone and goes, Hey, I need police out here right now. And it doesn't show up for an hour. Yeah. And to that single mother, I'd say, stop voting Democrat. <laughs> I mean, I, I hate to be that brash about it. I mean, flippant, I certainly don't mean it, but you know, your decisions at the, in the ballot box have consequences. They do. And, and, We've we've really shifted away from a situation where we examine the politician that's voting, running for a given office, and do their values and, and stated positions align with mine? Or is this the kind of representative I want in that position, whatever that position might be? And instead, we simply look at: is there a D or an R after their name? Okay, there's a D. Bang, he's my guy. Oh, there's an R. Bang, he's my guy. Um, and it's not the right way to continue this republic in the way that it has always been around. Um, we have an increasingly ignorant body of uh, the, the body politic is getting increasingly ignorant, increasingly lazy and increasingly willing to just accept whatever is shoveled their way. As long as they have bread and circuses or, you know, popcorn and Netflix, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, That's the know. new bread and circus, right? It kind of is, yeah. As long as they can oh, Netflix and chill, right? Yeah. Dr. Fuller, I've kept you on here an hour and a half, man, and I've still got questions piled up for you, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I guess we're going to have to do round six or whatever. Love to. Always have great conversations with you, Rich. I'm going to try and get through the uh, comments and try and get few folks some answers later today. Um, but it's always always a pleasure to talk to you and, and your audience, Rich. I'm always flattered to be included, especially now. I mean, you're getting some big name guests in here, buddy. So just the fact that I get to show up at all and put my name as an addendum to some of these guests that you've been getting on here. It's, it's, it's good for my ego. You know, so. what's fun. What's funny. I've said this before. A lot of people are like, man, where do you get these guests? And they're naming them off. I'm like, most of these people are my friends or they're American warrior society coin members. So it just goes to show the kind of people in our community. And when you look down the list of folks that are just watching today's show, I mean, they're, they're amazing people. And uh, I'm just so fortunate to be able to share my, my mornings with people like, like these guys and like you, man, honestly, well, you, you put out some good content, Rich, and you have reasoned, well rationed uh, approach to things. You talk about things intelligently. Um, and I, I think that as you point out, the people that you have viewing view for that reason, right? It's, it's because of the show that you put together and I think you should be applauded for it. I'm, I'm well, proud to be uh, even marginally a part of it. It's an, it's an absolute honor, man. And, um, Let's get you back on the show here in a, in a couple of weeks, TC, because I've got a list of stuff that I really want to get to. I look forward to it, my friend. All right, guys, be safe out there. Thanks for watching. And uh, remember, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>